Back to school for kids across the state in just a few days. So we are talking education in Michigan. My week starts right now. Detroit Public TV is supported by Business Leaders for Michigan, announcing open registration for the Michigan CEO Summit, November 12th at the Westin Book Cadillac Detroit. Keynote speaker is Tom Kelly, leader of a global design firm helping organizations innovate and grow. Motivational speakers, networking opportunities, and creative inspiration. That's the Business Leaders for Michigan CEO Summit, November 12th at the Westin Book Cadillac. Info at businessleadersformichigan.com slash events. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. We are so glad that you could join us tonight. As parents cheer wildly, kids across the state are getting ready to go back to school after Labor Day. But what kind of education are they getting here in Michigan? How does it compare to other states? And are they learning everything they need to know to go on to higher ed, compete with the global economy, heck, just get a job after graduation? Tonight, we're devoting the entire show to education, from our K-12 system here in the state, to teacher evaluations and their education, to the future of the Detroit public school system. Coming up, I have a conversation with the new state superintendent, Brian Whiston. Also, Stephen and Nolan are here, and we'll talk changes needed for Detroit public schools, and we'll have a look at some programs outside of the classroom that can help with student success. But let's start off with our MyWay contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Guys, I know you have your new backpack your new pair of shoes you are ready to head back to I'm school not going right back to school. oh i know Sending those kids children back to school Send that's those for sure. kids back to school it's been a long end of the summer um but you know as we start this entire show about education they won't let me within 100 yards of school for some reason. I don't <laughs> that's an entirely different show altogether. I got that paper. <laughs> <laughs> all right but let me start with you guys I and mean, we, we, we take a look at education in uh, michigan and let's focus really on k through 12. um what do you think are the some of the biggest issues that we're facing right now nolan i want to start with you infrastructure we got too large an infrastructure for the number of students we have we got to figure out a way to be leaner in in our delivery of education I think we haven't taken full advantage of technology and we could do more with technology to not only cut costs and make education more efficient but also to expose students to the best instructors and to teach them in the way that they are used to learning every one of these kids I've got a two-year-old and a three-year-old um, grandchildren they're walking around with iPads under their their arms they're telling and, you how to use the and, iPads and, I'm sure you know, they're active they're learning with their hands They're they're learning through their electronics we send them to school and put them in rows and stand a teacher in front of them and lecture them the same way we did you know back in the 1920s when there were no electronic stimulations so we're not explo exploiting technology we still make too many our, of our situations our, our, our decisions based on you know what's best for the institution what's best for um, you know the adults and not what makes the most sense for the students so there's a lot of things but I think one thing we don't talk about enough that's wrong with education is Michigan is what goes on in homes I don't think in our homes there's enough commitment to education there's not enough uh, parental uh, cooperation and partnership in educating ch children tend to send them off and say you guys do it and uh, you know all those factors. It takes a little outreach there from the school system as well. All right, Stephen, what do you think? Uh, I, I would say money and I mean that in two different ways. One is uh, the way we finance schools is absolutely broken here in in Michigan. I've been talking the last couple of weeks with uh, superintendents from the metro area about what they're looking forward to this fall. Every single one of them talks about how, and it doesn't matter, wealthy district, poor district, they all say that the way that we decide how much money every district gets is, is broken. Proposal A was a wonderful idea when we did it in 1994, but it doesn't work. Uh, post uh, the, the the sort of economic depression that we had at the end of the last decade, uh, but the other the other way I mean money is just in absolute terms. We do not spend enough in most districts uh, to 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 provide an adequate education for uh, for children. We're now doing an adequacy study uh, in Michigan, which I think will be a really important marker in terms of well, I can uh, tell you what that's identifying identifying how much you need to educate a kid, uh, that should point us toward 
uh, reform. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, we're going to continue our conversation here, but I want to turn now. Brian Whiston is Michigan's new state superintendent. He used to be the head of the Dearborn Public Schools, and he just started his new job in July. We sat down for a wide-ranging conversation about student achievement, teacher evaluations, and how Michigan compares to the rest of the country. Brian, you've said that you want to make Michigan a top 10 state for education in the next 10 years. So I guess to even go forward with that, do you have to start with a grade? What kind of grade would you give Michigan's education system right now? Well, it depends on what you, stats you look at, but mostly we're performing a lower third of the state. So that wouldn't be a very good grade that we would have to give ourselves if we were honestly looking at it. But with that said, there's a lot of great things happening in classrooms all over the state of Michigan. There's a lot of great teachers who are building relationships and making a difference in the lives of kids. So individual classrooms, a lot of great things going on. Overall as a system, you know, we need to do much better. All right, you just started the job on July 1st. Do you have a first 100 day plan or what do you have starting in the works now? Uh, as you said, we want to make Michigan a top 10 state in the next 10 years. So what we're doing is going around and listening to people, asking that question, getting input from business people, educators, classroom teachers, experts in the field, think tanks. Uh, we're having people come to board meetings in August and September and share that. And so we're really kind of listening and learning right now to see what we need to do to make Michigan a top 10 state. So what have you heard? Anything that has surprised you? No, nothing that's surprisingly, but we've heard that poverty counts. We've heard that we have to be engaged in preschool. We have to have opportunities and options for kids throughout their education. We need to have college and career ready things, including giving kids opportunities to graduate from high school with college credit. So I don't think we're going to hear anything uh, earth shattering, but it's important to listen to the experts so that, th that we can build a coalition around how do we make Michigan this. I could come out with my top 10 on my own, but then I don't have the support to change Michigan the way we need to. So it really is about listening and learning to others and building a coalition to move Michigan forward. All right, well, let's start talking about some of these specifics. And since you started talking about poverty, we can jump off right there because many of the low-performing schools have a high number of impoverished kids. How do you start to, to work on that when, when you're trying to help out? That, you know, it, it's a very important question. And unfortunately, we have focused on who is managing the districts, the role of the board, role of the superintendent, emergency manager. All those things are important, but if we don't focus on the classroom, we're not going to see changes in those districts. So what we need to do is provide support to those local districts and send almost an army of experts in to see what's happening into the classroom, make some recommendations that, of changes that need to be made, some professional development to make sure the staff knows how to work with students of poverty, know how to work with students who are struggling provide that support to the teachers, and then really change the classroom instruction from the teacher being a teacher to being a facilitator of the learning. Students need to take ownership, you know, whether it's in second or third grade, they should know their reading level, their math level, they should chart where they're at, and then as they grow throughout the year, they need to chart that growth. And when students are invested in their own education, they do much better. So we need to get students owning their education, teachers taking a step back, and facilitating the learning. Is there also a dot, dot, dot that parents need to have an ownership in the education as well? They do, and in, as you know, in many poverty situations, it may not be parents, it may be guardians or grandparents or other family members, but the answer to that is yes. You know, in, in the school that I used to run, we, it was a very low performing school. We got the parents engaged. We brought them in, we taught them how to, to work with their kids in reading and in math so that when they're at home, because see, we only have them 12% of the calendar year. 88% of the time they're not in schools. So we need that partnership with the parents to set aside. And as we start school, school's about to start, we need parents to set aside a half hour to an hour every night so that their students can read, play math games, you know, play games with the families, put down uh, the electronic equipments, turn off the TV, and really concentrate and have fun as a family uh, while they're learning. Let's talk a little bit about teachers. Do you think the teachers in Michigan feel supported? No, I don't think they do. And you know, education has been under attack in Michigan for the last decade or so. And I think that's unfortunate because you know, the teachers are the experts. They know what they need to do and we need to support them. And quite frankly, why would someone go in being a teacher right now? You're gonna graduate, you're gonna make it in the low 30s, and you're gonna have this constant pressure and attack. Now with that said, do we need to do better? We do, we do need to do better, but we need to do better by supporting our great teachers, helping the teachers who need, who are struggling to do better, and the handful of teachers that aren't cut out for teaching, we need to help them find an exit. How should we be evaluating our teachers? 
Well, whether you're a superintendent, a board member, an administrator, or a teacher, you should be evaluated. And the legislature, I'm calling on them to pass legislation on how we should be evaluating and what percentage of it should be uh, on student performance. And if the legislature passes a bill, that's great. If they don't, then I'll move forward using the authority of state superintendent to say districts, you need to evaluate using one of the four models that came out of the ball report. Uh, and if a local district wants a different model, they can use a different model, but with our limited dollars, we will only provide support and training in those four models that the Ball Report uh, came out with. So evaluating our teachers is very important. It's important for any employee, whether you work in the auto industry or any industry, to sit down with your boss and say, what are my strengths? What am I doing well at? And where are my opportunities to improve? And then we need to provide professional development for those areas where improvement's needed. And uh, you can only do that by having those conversations and by getting into the classroom and seeing how the teachers are performing. You've talked about uh, teacher pay just a, just a moment ago. You're supportive of merit pay? Merit pay, not in a traditional sense that says that, you know, uh, you do X, you get merit pay. But if you're teaching in, in a poverty situation, you deserve merit pay. If you're, if you're getting a year's worth of growth out of your students, you deserve merit pay. But what's difficult with merit pay in an education situation is you and I might both be teachers. I might have 10 or 15 special ed kids, five or six ELL kids. You might have none of those in your class. So your performance might look better than mine and I might actually be doing a better job based on the, where my students started and where I take them. So as long as we're talking about merit pay saying, here's where I got the students and here's where I took them, then I think merit pay is a fine part of the process, but uh, it's got to be worked out so that we're taking kids to a year's growth. Right now, the Department of Education, though, has no way to track or enforce what kind of merit pay is, is coming out for any teacher, though. No, that's negotiated at the local level. Uh, I certainly can use my bully pulpit to talk about things that I think are important. Um, let's talk about standardized testing, because I think for um, parents and students and teachers and administrators, it can be a little frustrating, especially what happened with the M steps last year. The fact that the test was changed at the last minute from what was supposed to be the smarter balanced, and then they had an entirely different test in the spring. You have just come out in the last couple of weeks saying that st that uh, test is now going to be shortened. Why is that going to be shortened? Well, as a local superintendent before taking on this role, I heard from our parents, our teachers, our community members about the length of the test and how we're spending too much time testing kids. Not only at a local level we test kids, but also the state level assessment. So working with, uh, I think the Department of Education did a great job at the last minute, as you said, having to come up with a new test. So I credit them for coming up with a new assessment, doing it quickly, and quite frankly, we had very little problems implementing it, except for the length. And so this year we're taking uh, eight hours uh, away from the 11th grade test and we're taking two and a half hours away from most of the elementary grades except fifth and eighth. And so we are shortening the test and that's step one. Long term, I'd like to have a conversation about what assessments do you need at a local level to drive instruction and what type of an assessment do we need at a state level to hold people accountable for the $14 billion in tax dollars that are used. But is there a way to do one assessment? so that we can save money on our assessments, but most importantly, save time and have more time for classroom instruction. All right, let's turn our attention to Detroit. How involved are you going to be in any kind of school reforms for the DPS? Well, I hope very involved. Constitutionally, the state superintendent, state board of education should be a leading player in education. And so we have had conversations with Detroit. We've had conversations with the, the governor and legislative leaders, you know, again, who leads Detroit schools is an important conversation, but I want to focus my time and energy on what's happening in the classrooms in Detroit and what we're going to do to support the teachers and provide them the training and support they need to make these students successful. So that's one focus. Number two, quite frankly, uh, you know, we're going to have to look at the Detroit's debt. If we don't help Detroit pay off their debt today, if we let it go four or five years and then the state or court makes us pay it off, the debt's going to be much worse. So I think it's a tough pill to swallow, but we need to help them with their debt today. Number three, we do need to return an elected board. You know, we live in a country that believes in democracy and believes in people having say, and so we need to return the elected board at some point as part of this process. And then number four, we really would like to see a return of a, of a superintendent uh, type position, uh, but I, I understand 
the discussions that are going on, but really the whole focus needs to be not on who's leading the schools, but what's happening in their classrooms. Brian and I also spoke about uh, consolidating school districts and we also talked about charter schools. We're going to have the entire interview with him. It went about 16, 17 minutes at myweek.org, so you can check that out there. But I want to bring you guys back into this conversation. Didn't you love this guy, though, and oh, brother, where art thou? Huh? <laughs> he looks like John Goodman. I, he, you know, I, as Brian is, I've known him since he was superintendent at uh, Dearborn and just in, in covering him through local news and, and whatnot. It was very interesting to talk to him because he does not have a very easy job. And I want to start oh. with that, the politics of um, the Department of Education here in Michigan. Nolan, how do you see that either playing in a positive way or how does it make that job difficult well, here in Michigan? I don't know about how it makes his job difficult. I think his job's impossible. Um, I, but I think the structure in Michigan is at the core or, or one of the first things we need to fix. I mean, you've got an elected school board and an elected governor both of them who set, supposedly set education policy. In the states where we're having the most, seeing the most effective education reform, child-centered education reform, you have unity in the policy making and in the decision making. We, we should have one or the other. Either the governor's out of education, which I think is, is ridiculous because you need accountability, or you should get rid of the elected board and make education a department under the governor, as it is in many, if not most states. What do you think that we should do in this circumstance? I, I mean, I agree that the, the way we do it doesn't work. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't know if it's the structure or if it's the people that we've had in, in those positions, but they have not worked uh, together. And there has not been, I, in my uh, judgment, there has not been the, 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 the kind of uh, independence and maybe aggression is even the right word from the state superintendent to take the lead on some issues. If you think about the situation in Detroit and how that has been left to the political class to, to solve one way or another, first with Jennifer Granholm, now with, with Rick Snyder, that's, uh, anything that's been proposed could have been proposed by the state superintendent yeah, uh, but he works. To, to, to change the way uh, uh, we deal with, with high-risk schools, whether they, the, the, the way we deal with the largest district and the lowest performer. But he's not an independent body. He works I, for the political uh, Agreed. Class. Those, but, those school board members are elected. They're heavily funded by the unions. Yeah. Most often they're elected um, with union dollars. They're not independent. So there's, no, there's not as much accountability there as you have through the governor's if it office. Were just All right, governor. but let's talk, about, let's talk about Detroit Public Schools. In, la mm -hmm. in last spring, the coalition came out with all of these ideas and, and saying this is what should be happening now with Detroit Public Schools. You have the governor who take that into account, take that into advisement and say, well, I'm going to come out with a, a, maybe something, a hybrid plan, using some of my ideas, using some of the coalition's report. It is now September, and we are heading into the first week of school for these kids. There is not one amount of legislation that has come out. There is nothing that has moved this this process forward. So where are we, Stephen? Let me start with you. Well, I mean, there are some bills being crafted, evidently, that, that will get introduced this fall to get all of this stuff done. Now, you know, um, with, with roads uh, still clogging up uh, the agenda, with some of the other things uh, that they want to get done, I don't know that this will get a lot of breathing room in, in, in the fall session. Um, and and I, I'm not sure how committed the governor even is to getting it done this fall. So I think that's something that we're looking at more of as a long-term project, which is a real problem because the district is, again, still running out of money. Uh, they were sp uh, Last year they spent $53 million on debt service. This year it's uh, expected to be $63 million. Uh, so they are looking at cutting again, cutting into teachers' health care, cutting into to other services. The district is dying. It's on life support. Uh, if we don't do something to radically change it soon, it's just going to, I feel like it's just going to waste away. And Detroit those, Public Schools. And, you know, we heard the other night from someone very close to the process that they weren't going to get to this to 2016. I don't know how you can wait. You've got the emergency manager uh, term is going to run out. And the governor said, I really don't want to appoint another emergency manager. I don't know what choice he'll have if he doesn't get this, um, if, if he doesn't get his agenda or some agenda in place place. I agree with Steve. I think you need a radical change or dissolve the thing and replace it with, with independent schools uh, similar to the, the New Orleans model, portfolio schools. I mean, but you've got to do yeah. something in a hurry here. And I see it sort of taking a seat behind roads and perhaps even behind energy policy now because they've got to do something to deal with the new EPA rules 
um, it keeps falling down the list of priorities. Which is really unfortunate because I think that everyone could agree in terms of recovery for the state and for the city of Detroit that you need to get that school system. And I think that goes to the larger picture of where we're looking at education and what Brian Wisson says, we want to make Michigan a top 10 state in the next 10 years. Is that feasible, Stephen? Uh, boy, 10 years, that's not a long time. Uh, and we're not working on it. Uh, you look at the things that, that other states uh, at the top of the performance chart are doing, we're not doing that stuff, which is the, they have been doubling down on funding and accountability. If you look at the states that are climbing the ladder, states like Tennessee and Florida uh, that have doubled down on accountability, uh, not so much funding and some uh, more innovation, we're not doing that either. So I'm not sure that we're in a position to, to, to be moving up uh, in, in any way because we're not emulating the best practices that other states are. And, and what do you are. think those best practices should be here in Michigan that we can start on, Nolan? Do you think that will make a difference? And, you know, we keep pretending we don't know what to do. And you could look at places like Tennessee and Florida and even Colorado. Uh, Massachusetts moved up rather quickly once it committed to a specific plan. Um, our problem is we can't get behind, everybody behind a single idea. We can't stop fighting over control of the schools, over govern governance, tug of war over who controls the money, who controls the building. Those other states had a unified vision and we don't. And if you don't start with a unified vi vision, you're not going to get there in 10 years. You're not going to get there in 30 years. Well, Michigan definitely has its work cut out for it. All right, thanks guys. And finally tonight, what happens in the classroom is important, but activities after school can also help kids with their long-term success. And here's a look at one program as part of Detroit Public Television's American Graduate Champions Project. And I've got pictures and video of you all from when you were in fifth grade oh, no. No, that you that you are going to love. Racket Up Detroit is an out of school youth development program that uses the sport of squash as a way of engaging kids. We teach the sport as a entry point into their lives. Racket Up Darion, good. They are committing to three days a week, about three hours each of those days. They'll spend about half their time in the classroom working on homework and inside our literacy program. Grab the book that you selected from the library. You can grab a bean bag and find somewhere to read, or you can sit in a circle. And they'll spend about half their time on the squash court. Rack it up! Those hours here, not only do they help me with school or squash, but it's like something new every day once you walk in through those doors. We had a notion early on that being community-based, focused in a small set of neighborhoods, tied to neighborhood schools, would reinforce what we were trying to do, which is we were ultimately trying to build community. So we'll probably get started in like two or three more minutes. It's not just about the squash and the game. It's about the education. It's showing the kids something different. Community service projects, book club, anthology work. So that's a little bit of what we're doing today in the classroom. In the fifth grade when I came, I started off with a low GPA, so a 2.5. But as the years went by, it went up, so it went up to a 3.0, and then eventually, at the end of my last year, which was eighth grade in middle school, I graduated with a 4.0. We're going to start off with our warm-up. Because the program is not just one thing, it's holistic, to be able to see students mature and make good choices, maybe that they wouldn't have made a year ago, to see them take on leadership roles within the program, when maybe they were shy or unsure of themselves initially. So you ready for tomorrow, Chicago? Oh uh, yeah, I'm ready. You did hear that all of you are in, right? Yeah. You came off the wait list. Well, now we did. Yeah. Well, so everybody, ca everybody came off the wait list. What's it like to be coaching your brother when he's in a group of other kids? My role model was Mr. Derrick when I was little. So I said, okay, I wanted to do this because I want to be like Mr. Derrick when I grow up. I'm part of something very inspiring. I know that I'm going to get to see people that I really love, whether it's our staff or our volunteers, and certainly our kids. Your sister, Armani, is heading off to Chicago this weekend. How do you think she's going to do? Mr. Derek is kind of like family to me and a second father because he helped me become a great squash player, and he educated me in academics. Four hand grip, four hand grip. Pretend you're shaking hands with your racket. My being in their lives is important, that it matters. Knowing that I'm also giving other people that opportunity to have meaning and purpose, I wouldn't trade it. I couldn't imagine doing something else.
It's a great story. And that is going to do it for My Week. Thanks so much for joining us. You can always head to myweek.org for shows on demand and share them with your friends. We are also on Twitter and on Facebook. Have a great holiday weekend. Kids, have fun going back to school. We'll see you next week. Take care. This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Detroit Public TV is supported by business leaders for Michigan, announcing open registration for the Michigan CEO Summit, November 12th at the Weston Book Cadillac Detroit. Topics include trends that could affect your bottom line and how well Michigan is doing in attracting and growing good-paying jobs. A great lineup of speakers, networking opportunities, and creative inspiration. That's the Business Leaders for Michigan CEO Summit, November 12th at the Westin Book Cadillac. Info at businessleadersformichigan.com events. Funding is also provided by Delta.